Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Loose Wheels, the auto racing podcast for CentralMaine.com. I'm Travis Barrett. I'm the host of Loose Wheels. I am the auto racing writer at the Kennebec Journal and the Morning Sentinel. And uh, we're back for another week. We've got, a, we've got a good show. I promised you last week that I would make it up to you, and I think I did. I think you can be the judges, but I think I did. We uh, got a couple of first-time uh, winners this season to join us on the podcast. We're going to catch up with uh, Trevor Sanborn, who won for the first time this season at Beach Ridge Motor Speedway in Scarborough, and in doing so also took over the uh, track point lead down there. And then a familiar face to Wiscasset Speedway, but a, uh, a new face in victory lane over there as Nick Reno uh, earned his first career pro stock slash super late model win uh, at Wiscasset on Saturday night. We were there to cover it. And uh, we caught up with Nick this week to talk a little bit about the track and kind of what's going on there. So uh, really happy about that. As always, uh, centralmain.com slash sports. Invite you to check it out. Uh, find all your sports and auto racing coverage this summer there. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Central Maine Sports, and certainly on Twitter at Central ME Sports. Uh, you can give me a follow on Twitter at T Barrett GWC. Keep up with what we're covering and uh, where we're at Uh It's been, we're kind of hitting that point in the summer here now. We're in mid-July, and uh, it looks like championship battles are are starting to kind of come into into focus a little bit, uh, particularly um, at Beach Ridge, where it looks like there's three or four cars down there that are starting to break out a little bit. And certainly um, at Wiscasset, though, Wiscasset's been kind of an interesting, you know, an interesting study in that. Nick Reno is a great example of a driver who um, is not running you know, every week, um, but he's racing in both the uh, pro stock and the modified divisions over there, and he's won uh, three times in the last three weeks, four weeks in, the, in those divisions. He's won two straight modified races heading into this weekend, and, um, of course, he won the pro stock feature last week. But um, let's, I want to catch up with Nick here first to kind of kick off the podcast. Really a, a great conversation. Um, he had some interesting thoughts on, on Wiscasset, on some of the changes, on how he's grown up as a driver. And certainly I think uh, you're going to hear towards the end of, of our chat with him um, about kind of, you know, the weekly racer mentality. And it's easy to kind of um, pick on them a little bit for, for some crashes and some wrecks and those kind of things. But uh, Nick has an interesting take on, on why that is. So I think we should just get to the show, really. You don't want to hear me talk. You're going to get to hear me talk a little bit later. Uh, in TB's press box, but uh, let's jump into it. Uh, Nick Reno of West Bath, uh, who won the Pro Stock feature at Wiscasset Speedway. He's got multiple wins at the track in his career, which now spans 15 years. Yes, he makes me feel old, uh, but it was his first win in a Pro Stock where he is technically a Rookie of the Year contender this season. So we've got Nick Reno on the phone. Uh, Nick is the most recent uh, Pro Stock winner at Wiscasset Speedway. Nick, I want to thank you for taking a few minutes out of your day to, to join me and do this. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So I thought it was really funny the other night because I asked you after kind of what had been kind of a crazy uh, last uh, five laps or so over there, I asked you if that was just the way you dreamed your first win would come. And and I thought you said something that was pretty interesting. You said, I never really, you never really think about what it's going to be like. So now you've You've had a couple days. Um, was that first win everything you thought it would be? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, it was pretty great. I mean, uh, I, I never really gave it much thought about what the first one in the pro stock would be because I just have been racing for so many years. Yeah. You know, um, I, I kind of assumed it would probably come up with Cassie Speedway. We've, we've jumped around a little bit, but not much. But yeah. uh, I think to get my first win at, at my home track. Yeah. Was it... Um... You, I think you had mentioned that you, you felt like you had some bad luck for a couple of weeks, but did you feel like you were that you were kind of on target to, to get a win here pretty soon? Or as a rookie in the division, um, even with all your experience there in other cars, were you um, did you surprise yourself a little bit the other night? Well, I mean, coming in into the in the season as a rookie, we we had some pretty high expectations. I mean, we didn't necessarily uh, expect to win, but after the, past, the way the car has been running for the past. Uh, it's only a fourth race there mm. with that car. Um, the first race there, I think we got like a fifth place. The second, the second race there, we were we were running uh, in contention for the win, and, and um, we we made contact with another car and, and spun out, and uh, we drove back to second place. So, um, and then in our third race there with that car, we'd uh, 
uh, or battling for the lead again in, in the car had, uh, had mechanical failures. So, so we knew the car was really strong, mm -hmm. and um, we were really hoping to just finish the deal this time. Yeah. When when AJ got by you there and and got the lead, I guess it was uh, not quite halfway through that race. So many times you see guys um, who have the lead, do everything you can to hold it. Once they once they lose it, either the car drops off or the motivation changes. But I thought one of the things that was most impressive the other night was that um, when you lost the lead, you didn't go anywhere. I mean, you, you hounded him until you finally got an opportunity on a restart. Is that something that... I don't know. Did you kind of tell yourself, like, um, you know, my race isn't over here and we're going to get another shot at this? Or were you just surprised? Or, or was your car just that consistent towards the end of the day? Well, I mean, it was a little bit of both. I mean, the car was really consistent. Um, what had happened was, you know, we were leaving the race. I knew I had a really strong car. And um, I guess he, he just nosed out on a, on, a, on a restart, basically. So they gave him the, the position. So I was kind of wound up about that. And, and um, after that restart, I kind of overdrove the car a little bit. He got a, you know, two or three car, car like lead at most and uh, kind of sustained that until the next caution. But, you know, once I settled back down, I said, okay, it's time to, you know, tighten my belt back up and go back after this win. And, um, you know, I really attacked it from there. Yeah. So, okay, so here's what I really want to ask you now then. Um, because I remember I remember the young Nick Reno, right, with in those late model battles 10 years ago with, with Josh St. Clair and all those guys. And I wonder if if young Nick Reno would have been able to kind of keep his composure a little bit and, and relax for the second half of that race. And I think for everybody, right, there's a, there's a, there's a maturing process that comes as a race car driver. And so I wonder if you feel like as you've gotten older, if that kind of helped you the other night. Yeah, I definitely think that has to come with on. Yeah. Um, I, I have to say back in, in the younger days, it probably would have, I probably would have ended that race and probably, you know, the fifth place. <laughs> but you know, you learn to you learn to kind of gather your head back up and, and go back after it when when circumstances don't go your way. You know, right. it, it comes with time. It, um, so I, I would love to ask you about. Um, you know, I remember. You, obviously, you raced there. What through probably when when Dave still owned the track, and you were there when Doug owned the track. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I've, I've been through a while. I think I started in uh, must have been around 2003. Wow. You started racing there? Yeah, so you're getting old like me. I don't want to. I don't want to point that out. Yeah. But I'll allow yeah. it. Um, yes. When the when the Jordans took over the track and these last couple of years, especially, what what stands out to you the most about was Cassett Speedway? What, what what's the thing that kind of has changed oh, just the most? The, the, the family environment. I mean, you're you're always welcome, and everybody's welcome. Just yeah. it's it's uh, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, they they've done huge improvements to the track. They they treat you like you know your family yeah. and. You can't beat that. Um, I mean, I've raced at other tracks, and and of course, you know, with Cassidy being my home track, I'm gonna feel a little more comfortable there. But you go to the other track, so you don't get the uh, the family atmosphere that you do uh, at with Cassidy Speedway. Yeah, I remember. Um, I think it was last year, maybe it was two years ago now, but uh, going back to cover the Coastal 200, and it was the first time I'd been there in years. And I looked around, and I just could not believe how different the place looked. It's it's unbelievable what they've done. Yeah, such great improvements. I mean, the, the place is just neatened up and cleaned up so well, and and uh, it's it's made it a lot funner as well. You yeah. know? I never would have imagined uh, the fans, they got they got to appreciate it. Yeah, I, I never would have imagined that Wiscasset Speedway would have basically a wall all the way around. I mean, I just remember watching guys yeah. go off of turn three and thinking, uh oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then I don't uh, I don't think it's affected the cars that much as far as getting hurt because uh, people seem to maybe. I, I don't know. I, doing three and four, turn three and four has never really been one real popular to go down over. But you know, when they did, they really went out into the woods. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's probably collected some cars, but I wouldn't say that it's collected any more than if the wall wasn't there. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I think you're right. So it, it definitely speeds up the process of getting the you know, getting the show back on the road and cleaning up, you know, down there, fishing them out of the woods with the yeah. uh, chainsaws. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how did uh, how did you get started racing? No, oh, it's my well, I'm a third generation driver. My, my grandfather raced for years. He raced uh, with Cassidy and Beechridge, and my father raced uh, with Cassidy and Beechridge as well. And and uh, with Cassidy's kind of always been my family's home, so it's, yeah. it's well, we've been close. It's close to home as well. So yeah. um, you know, it's it's just it's in the family. 
<laughs> Can't get away from it. You didn't have a choice, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. When when did um do you remember when like how old you were or when you first got the itch to start driving? Because I'm going to assume you, especially with your dad and your grandfather, that you were you were always around race cars and probably helping out where you could working on them. When, yeah. When did you get the itch to drive? You know, I always really had the the love for it at a younger age, but I, I can't I don't really say that I had the itch to actually do the driving part of it until I was um. I think I was probably a junior or a senior in high school, you know, when I was, uh, when I actually decided I wanted to, and I'm not even sure that I wanted to drive as much as my father wanted to, to see me drive, you know. <laughs> right. Um, I was I was content helping him and, you know, being on the pit crew for him and, and whatnot. So, yeah. But, you know, after, after you strapped in the first time, it was kind of all done from there. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, I, the, the chance for you to go um, pro stock slash super late model racing this year, um, how did that? How did that conversation kind of get started? Had that been something you had been wanting to try for a while, or um, did an opportunity uh, sort of it's, fall? It's something, yeah, it's something I want, I've always wanted to, to, to drive. I mean, obviously, it's, it's the top level that was, you know, name here. Mm. Um, and a uh, friend of mine, not only to true, they had a, a pro stop that they um, they asked me if I'd want to drive for a few races, and, and um, we did. We drove it for a couple races last year, a couple past races we attempted for. Um, I think I raced one at West Cassett, and um, they decided uh, they were going to uh, get out of the ownership role. Uh, still huge supporters of mine in, in racing and whatnot, and we ended up buying the car from them, and and uh, I guess the rest is history. You know, we're, we're racing it, and we're, gonna, we're not going to race a full season this year. We're just going to race a couple more races. Probably with it this year. We, we're really going to concentrate on the Boss Hog 150 there at West Cassett. And, yeah. And whatever else comes our way, but we're not really pushing the pro stop thing this year. We're kind of concentrating on the modified that we race uh, every other week at the uh, pro stop start racing. Yeah, well, that kind of led me to right to my next question was um, the modifieds to me. I don't. I I always feel like they look like they're a ton of fun to race, but for whatever reason, I feel like there's just never whether it's whether it's here, whether it's at Oxford, whether it's the the past modified tour. I, I, I yet to figure out why there aren't more guys driving them. Have, can you put your finger on that for me? <laughs> I, I can because yeah. they're they're actually a fairly affordable car and they're a blast to drive. Yeah. You know, uh, oh, I love them. When they first came out with the class, I don't even know when uh, Mayberry did on the tour, and uh, my father built one. He was one of the first ones to build a modified, and, and he raced it. And then when this cast to come back out with them, we, we said we got to have one because they're just a blast. Yeah. You know. Um, and I've had fairly good luck with it. Kind of fits my driving style, I think, a little bit. And uh, uh, we're on we one last two two races in a row, and I'm modified. So, so when you say it fits your driving style, how how so? Is it do you drive them do you drive them harder than you would drive a pro stock, or are they a little more finicky? Um, not not necessarily a pro stock. Uh, you could be a little more aggressive than you do in a late model. Yep. With them, uh, but not necessarily a pro stock. A, a pro stock, you can be pretty aggressive as well. Uh, so. <laughs> I, I just, or maybe I just like them. I don't know. <laughs> it's just they're, they're looking fun to drive. You, you have to, you have to muscle them around. You have to throw them into the corner, and you have to, in order to be fast. I mean, but you also have to be smooth at the same time. So right. you can't over, you can't overheat. It's not very forgiving. Right, you know, the right, right. Off, you can, you can set back and cool your tires off and go at it again. The modifieds, once you, once you get your tires heated up, they're, they're pretty much you're done for the race. So yeah. you got to have some finesse with it as well. Well, when you say you have to muscle them around a little bit, I, I think you're built for that probably. I, I probably could not. I don't know if you remember, but I'm I'm pretty thin. So I'll I'll let you <laughs> I'll let you drive the modified. That probably suits you a little better than me. Um, yeah, I mean, so so let's see. So we have the modifieds that you obviously your goal is to to win a championship there. I would assume, and you're gonna try to run that Boss Hog 150. Um, is there anything else, like, kind of on your, whether it's this year or in years in the future, is there anything on your bucket list that you haven't raced yet or that you haven't tried that you'd like to do? Um, well, I mean, obviously, we actually didn't plan on even racing a full season with a modified this year. So as far as championship this year, um, if it works out, it does. If it, you know, if it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah. We're not really chasing the points. I've, I've only chased around for points one, one season in my whole career. <laughs> And I find it kind of the fun out of it. Yep. I mean, there's some drivers that that's all they do is chase points, and they love it, which is, you know, good for them. But uh, but as far as bucket list goes, I mean, obviously the Oxford 250 is is, is the bottom of the bucket list to just to qualify for it. You know, under my own power, you know, no provisionals, no nothing would be that would be 
uh, kind of the icing on the cake of my career. I think just to, to have a good, decent run in that race. And um, I don't know if we have any attentions on trying to race that race this year or not. It's still, uh, still up in the air. Yep. Well, you've got a few weeks still to decide, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you've, got, you've got a little bit of summer left before it gets here. Um, yeah. The, the only issue with that race is it's just, it, it takes so much uh, support and budget and everything out of your out of your whole season just to run that, run that one race, you know. Yeah. It takes a lot of your focus, so. I saw, the, the Pro Stock race I saw the other night at Wiscasset, which, again, I know we talked, I mentioned before about, you know, kind of how crazy it got at the end there a little bit. And I feel like, um, it sounds awful when I say it. I don't mean it as a knock on the division. I feel like weekly racing sometimes always can get that way. I, I was telling somebody that I feel like, um, you know, in those 30, 40, 50 lap races, whatever the, the distance is on that night, it's hard to win those races. And I think when guys have a chance to win, they're going to do whatever they can to try and win. I think that leads to some carnage. Um, I think that leads to some torn up race cars on occasion. But but generally speaking, how competitive do you think that Wiscasset Pro Stock Field is week to week? Um, I think it's fairly competitive. I mean, there's, uh, I think there's, on any given night, there's at least four or five cars that can win the race uh, mm-hmm. speed-wise. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's another four or five that could get lucky. Um, you know, and there's, there's always at least, it seems like at least 15, 16 to, to 18 cars there this year on yeah. a weekly weekly basis, but start the race anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the only the issue with it is there is some inexperience, also even for veterans that, that are just, just making mistakes that are costing people, you know, uh, race cars and, yeah. and, and, and mistakes. I mean, mistakes are going to happen in racing. It's just what happens. It's, it's part of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know some of the some of the starts were screwed up last week, but uh, you know, I think a lot of it was, was people spinning the tires on the restarts and, and whatnot. So, hmm. is do you? Is it fair to say though that that's sort of a um, that's kind of a byproduct of weekly racing? I mean, these guys aren't. Um, they're not tour guys, right? For a reason, whether it's whether it's budget, yeah. whether it's experience. I wonder if if you have to be willing to accept some of that if you're running weekly anywhere, not just at Wiscasset, but anywhere. Yeah, and, and I think it's more of a, a passionate level of racing, though, also, which which, mm-hmm. which puts people maybe they can drive the cars a little bit, cars a little bit harder. You know, they're not um, they, a lot of these guys that are racing weekly. They don't have a big budget, and they don't have uh, they don't have a short thing. You know, they start racing every race like it could be their last race or it could be their uh, their only chance to impress somebody. You know, a lot of these, these big tour races, the guys, they know what they're doing next week or next year yep. or, or whatnot, you know. Yep. I don't think they're driving with as much passion. So yep. uh, that's a double-edged sword in, in, in as far as we could racing goes, I think, you know. It's good to see that passion, but that passion gets people in trouble as well. I, I could not agree with you more, honestly. I think that's, that's really well said and... Uh... Listen. On that note, speaking of passion, congratulations again on your on your first pro stock win over there. I know you've won you've won a bunch of races in other divisions, but I want to thank you for taking a few minutes. And uh, man, best of luck to you the rest of the year. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. That was fun. That was fun with Nick. I uh, I don't know Nick particularly well. Um, know of him. I've covered him for years, but um, that was a good conversation. I thought I, I thought he kind of hit the nail right on the head and. And that kind of brings me to this week's uh, TB's Press Box segment when we talk about kind of whatever's on my mind. But I think it's 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 kind of trendy to um, talk about uh, weekly racing, particularly when you get into pro stock and super late model divisions, and talk about them in terms of carnage and wrecks. And, you know, last Saturday night was a great example of a bunch of caution flags, a bunch of wrecks, some of which probably certainly could have been avoided over the last five or six laps of that race. But I'll be honest with you, I, I, don't, th- I don't think there's a problem. Um, I have long contended that, well, yes, there are some drivers who probably should have started racing in some other divisions first. I don't think super late models or late models are where you should start. Um, but I also contend that, you know, these are not touring racers. These are not pro all-star series drivers. These are not necessarily guys with full-time rides, with contracts, and all of that kind of stuff. I, I think weekly racing is built on urgency, right? Short races, guys who want to win. And, and I, think, I think Nick Reno is 110% correct. I don't want to go to a short track race and watch a guy running sixth 
and be content to just run six. Eh. You know, it's not about points racing, right? There's some entertainment value there. I want to know that when that guy can sniff the lead, he's doing everything he can to try to win. And, and I think that's what you get. I think these races, <clears throat> excuse me, we forget. These races are really hard to win. I don't care if it's at Beach Ridge Motor Speedway, and we're going to talk to Trevor Sanborn in a little bit about that field and what they're up against every week. Um, and I, I don't care if it's at Oxford, and I don't care if it's at Wiscasset. Um, every one of those tracks you can make a case for. You can make a case at Beach Ridge. Um, they've got a number of track champions. They've got a number of guys that have been racing there for a long time and are very, very, very good there. And that's a tough track to get a hold of anyway. To win there, you've done something. At Oxford, you're not just racing the weekly field every week. You're also racing guys who come in and are trying to get ready for the Oxford 250. Every season, same story. Those Saturday summer nights are dotted with guys who are getting ready for the Oxford 250. And with Cassett. You know, again, 16, 17, 18 car fields, but let's not forget, it's Maine's fastest racetrack, and it, it's got some banking to it, and um, it can be a little bit of a one-groove track. It's not easy to win there. My point is, I don't expect to go see a weekly super late model race and watch it go caution-free. It's not the point, right? And it's not entertaining. I don't want to... <laughs> the running joke with me is whatever gets me home the fastest. But in, in actuality, I don't want to watch five features in a night and see one caution flag. I, that's not entertainment. Um, I want to see guys going for it. I want to see guy, people in the stands. Um, I said to somebody the other night after that race, uh, one of the track officials was like, oh, my word, thank God that pro stock race is over. What a nightmare. And I pointed out that the crowd reaction at the end of Nick Reno's win was exactly what you wanted. People were into it. Yeah, the race took over 45 minutes to run, but you know what? People enjoyed it. People had a rooting interest. It's short track racing. That's what it's supposed to be about. So I think if you're going to a weekly race and you're expecting guys to run like past tour teams do where it's 150 laps and it's give and take and it's not my day, I'll let you have it this time around, then you're looking at it the wrong way. I think short track racing right now is good. I don't think it's great. I think we need more cars in the support divisions. But you know what? I'm not writing the checks, so it's easy for me to say. But more to the point, I think what we watched last week at Wiscast at Speedway was absolutely, um, it was interesting. It was, you know, the drivers were engaged. The fans were engaged. And and it was a really, really good product. You're going to have some wrecks. You're going to have some cautions. You're going to have some guys make mistakes. In the end, it's kind of what we like about it, right? It's a little bit unpredictable. So, I, I, you know, I say good for Wiz Cassett, and I, and I say thanks again to Nick Reno for coming on because I think he completely summed it up. Now, let's switch gears, right? We've got another one. Trevor Sanborn, uh, I've known Trevor for a long time and um, really glad to have him on. Um, you know, he won at Beach Ridge. He's, he's got his own car this year for the first time. He's not driving for anybody else. He, 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 he bought a car. And it's the first time in a long time he's kind of owned his own fate, if you will. And um, I think it was really nice to see him win a Beach Ridge last weekend, take over the points lead down there. You know, Trevor has had some real, some real near misses at Beach Ridge in the, in the uh, in past 300s there. And, and I think this year he's got a really good car, and I think he's got a car that's kind of rounding into form as we hit the, the meat of the summer schedule. And he's got a car he's really happy with. So uh, a lot of fun to catch up with him uh, on this week's Loose Wheels. Here is Trevor Sanborn. So we are here with uh, Trevor Sanborn, who's the most recent winner at Beach Ridge Motor Speedway. Trevor, thanks for uh, taking a few minutes to uh, join us on the podcast. Uh, thank you. Thanks for giving me a call. Well, it was down to you or some guy that's been retired for the last eight years, so I decided I probably should call you before it got to be too long. <laughs> <laughs> I think that nice of you. You're welcome. You're welcome. I didn't want you to feel too special. Um, so... Uh, you know, you won a Beach Ridge the other night. That had to feel uh, that had to feel pretty good for you. What what kind of did you feel like you were getting close to winning races over there, or did you take yourself by surprise a little bit? Uh, well, we started the year. We thought we were pretty good down the, the ridge, and the car I don't know took a turn for the worse. But we was having trouble with tires because we have to we can't buy poor tires every week there. We have to do two every week, so you got to match them two up with the old two, and kind of a, a struggle at times, but I think we figured it out, and uh, we 
decided to race the, the pass race a few weeks ago down there. And we obviously buy four tires for the pass race, but we practiced on four new tires also, and the car was awesome. And we just realized right then that our Saturday night program was just all about tires. And we ended up third in the pass race, and we didn't touch a thing off the car. Hmm. I mean, Tony Richmond is the crew chief on the car. My brother Corey is a fodder. I have a couple other crew guys. They all agree. Let's not touch the car. Let's just go back and try to, you know, get the tire, the sagger, and everything corrected, And which was last week. And we just opened the tires on, went out for a scuff session the last practice. Honestly, it's the best race car I ever drove there. How, so I wonder, I wonder at Beechridge too, I hear it all the time, um, how much of it is a mental game there? Because you talk about the tire management part of it, but I feel like um, Beechridge for the last, I don't know, whatever, half decade, decade, however far you want to go back, people can go back further than I can for sure. It just seems like every week there is such a grind. Like you know you're starting in the back, you know yet when you're high in the points, you know – that it's hard to pass, and, and I just wonder if if every week at Beechridge you just kind of have to remind yourself, like, look, it's going to be a dogfight, and, and you get out of it where you get out of it, and you try not to go in w- with expectations every week that are, I have to get to the front, I have to get to the front. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, you know, the, the thing is with Beechridge, they're only 40 lap events, hmm. and Honestly, there's no managing tires in that part of it as far as driving the car hard. Right. Uh, you got to manage your tires in the pit area and get, get the tires right before you go out on the racetrack. Right. Everyone is going as hard as they can go from the drop of the green to lap 40. Mm. And that ain't really managing tires. But the worst thing about, um, about it all is high point guy or winner always has to start at the back. It's not a draw. So it makes it twice as hard. And I feel like Beach Ridge, Beach Ridge's Saturday night guys that race in the Pro Series, it's probably one of the hardest divisions. I mean, and I'm talking as far as Pass or, or Grand State or anything or even Austin Plain Speedway. They have some of the most talented drivers on Saturday nights and the stiffest competition mm. around. Mm. So it makes it so hard. Yeah. And when I go to race against them guys every week, I know that I'm racing against, you know, some of the best around. Yeah. And to beat them, and when we do beat them, I know that we have a good enough car to go, you know, pass to a racing at the bridge or up to Oxford because Oxford's similar. Mm. Mm. Would you, I mean, you've had... <laughs> There have been ups and downs for you, obviously, for several years, right? And I think one of the things that I wanted to yep. ask you about is kind of having the chance to run somewhere full-time this year. You, you mentioned to me before we got started that, you know, this is your own car now and you're not driving for somebody else. Um, I, I understand there's probably financial headaches that go along with that. But for you, how nice is it just to know that you have a regular ride this year um, that's competitive? It's, I should have done this years back. I should have never sold my car, to be honest. And, you know, it took me a little while financially to get back to where I am. But once you own the car again, I mean, it's not that bad financially once you have everything. I mean, yeah, there's some expenses with maintenance and tires and that, but it just, when you, when you drive with somebody else, you know, you never can make all the calls to the pit area or anything. And, now, I have such a good relationship with Tony Ricci. I trust him with mm-hmm. anything yeah. as far as turning wrenches on that race car. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just been like a dream come true. It, it all is falling into place, I feel like. And yeah. I think that, you know, Tony plays a big part in a lot of my success this year so far. And also, you know, my brother Corey and... A couple other crew, a couple other crew members. Yeah. Well, tell me. I, I was going to ask you about Tony. I think Tony is one of those guys that um, I don't think he gets a lot of credit for what he does for a, what he's done over the years. Like I, I feel like anytime Tony's hands are on a race car, it goes pretty well. 
no matter who he's worked with. I, I believe that 100%. Yeah. He doesn't get enough credit. He is one of the smartest guys I know that works on race cars up here, you know, in the Northeast, yeah. New England area. Um, and he can do shocks. He's a fabricator. He can do anything there is to that race car. And whenever I turn to him and say, you know, the car's doing this, he's got something to try. <laughs> and 90% of the time, it goes the right way yeah. with it. He goes the right way with it. So, well, he you doesn't. Know, Tony deserves a lot of credit. Yeah, I was going to say, by his very nature, though, he doesn't like a lot of credit, right? He's, whenever you, I know for me over no, the years, no, anytime I've ever, really. ever said anything nice to him, it's always met with an eye roll and a laugh and, you know, ah, well, I lucked into it. But I don't, I don't think anyone that knows him believes that, you know? I think we all know, like you said, he's, he can do a lot of things and he can make race cars go. And I, I think that's part of the game, right? Like, you have to be able to make them go fast. Hey, hey, man, it's, it's, 80% of the reason why I'm going. Yeah. I mean, I'm just a driver. Tony, you know, puts the car under me. Yeah. And I'm telling you, he's, I could not do this without him. Mm. It's that simple. I couldn't do, I mean, yeah, I could do racing, but I don't know that I have a car going as good as it is right. without him. Right. So let me ask you about what happened. So, um, well, how important is the championship to you, or is, have you not really thought about that? Because with that win on Saturday night, you took over the points lead at Beach Ridge. I don't remember the last time I saw Trevor Stanborn's name at the top of the point standings. So I don't know. Is it, are you thinking about it yet? Is it too early to think about that, or is that really kind of your goal for the season? Well, it was it was the goal from the beginning, but honestly, I haven't even thought about it. I mean, <laughs> it is what it is, and. You know, the way I think, you know, when I say it is what it is, it's just, I don't worry about it. You know, if it comes down to it, then awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not going to stress out over it. You know, I'm, I'm there to win races and finish up front, but it's something. Mm -hmm. If we don't win it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go win for, for another one next year. We'll try for another one, you know, yeah. get another one. Um, are there, uh, outside of, um, Outside of Beach Ridge and, and racing there on Saturday nights, um, are there any other races that you have circled on your calendar this year? I have a sneaky suspicion the answer is yes, that there are a couple of races you're interested in. <laughs> yeah, there are a few. We definitely are going to run around 50, and I don't know if we'll run anything in between um, now and the Oxford 250 as far as past races or anywhere else other than Saturday night races at Beach Ridge, but... Yep. After the Austin 250, we're definitely going to run a few pass races around. Yeah. Is the 300 on your schedule? Is it still a 300 or is it uh, yeah. this year? I can't remember. Did they change? Well, it's, it's changed. Yeah. It's changed. Yeah. I think it's actually 150 now this fall. So I see. Well, but the, that's, that's definitely a plan. The plan. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to bring up bad memories, but I've known you for a long time. I feel like 150 laps. If that race had been 150 laps however many years ago, you probably would have won a couple of those by now. <laughs> well, yeah, there was, a, there was a time there from like 2007 to 2011 or yeah. 12 that I, did, I finished inside the top five every race. Yeah. And I decided to uh, sell a race car and drive for other people and Things didn't go that well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, if you, I don't know, I mean, like I was saying, again, I, I can tell that I'm getting old because I feel like every week when I talk to people, I can say I've known you for a long time, and I, I definitely have known you for a long time. We've always gotten along. I wonder, yeah. I don't know, if, if uh, boy, 10 years ago, um, I wonder how, how have you changed as a driver or maybe even kind of how do you, have you changed how you approach the sport? To me, you've always been pretty laid back, but I wonder if as you've gotten older, if you, I don't know, if you look at uh, wins and and losses, if you will, any differently. Like, does it, I don't know, do you get as fired up when you win? Do you get as crushed when you when you don't win, when you feel like you have a car that should win now that you're a little bit older? Uh, well, I do get fired up when I win, but I'm not as, you're right, I'm not as crushed when I don't win it. Honestly, it's just another day to me, and I don't take it, you know, to heart. Yeah. But when, we, when I win, you know, it means a lot. And uh, 
that's why I want to continue to win, but you can't win them all. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's funny because I think I think a lot of young race car drivers, I think they say that, you know, oh, you can't win them all. But in the back of their head, they think, yeah, but maybe I could. And I think that's a tough thing to get yeah. through. I think last week I talked to Austin Terrio, and even he talked about how, um, you know, he was disappointed to go to Spud Speedway and have mechanical issues and have a bad day, knowing that he was back home yeah. and it was his first pass race of the year. But he also said to me something I thought was interesting, which was, but you know what? Now I've done it long enough. You know you're going to have those days, and you can't you can't let them eat you up. Is it hard? Is it hard to not let bad days eat you up? Maybe especially when you're young and trying to make a name for yourself. Yeah, when you're young it is, but yeah. Now I don't even care. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't want nothing bother me really anymore. Uh, I mean, yeah. It changed big time in ten years. I mean, I started racing a tour in 2007, yeah. so 11 years ago, and yeah. I wanted to win every race we went into with uh, Jay Cushman's car. You know, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, we ran out front almost every race. Right. And, did really, really well, but it, it doesn't bother me as much anymore, you know, yeah. if you have a bad day. Right. Well, you're like 45 years old now, aren't you? So I, you're getting older. Yeah, pretty close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're still younger than I am, so. Um, would That's you... right. <laughs> you got me beat by 45. Yeah, 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 right. Um, so, <laughs> I, <laughs> that's awesome. So let me ask you, um, kind of, you touched on it a little bit before, but um, about that, the uh, the competition level at Beach Ridge, um, it, I want to kind of just wrap up by kind of going back to your win this weekend. I, I look at some of the guys that are in that field every week, um, you know, whether it's Dave Farrington, Reed Lamfer, Kirk Gary, who won the Oxford 250 and has won a bunch of races this year. I mean, those are guys that have won championships, finished on the podium at the Oxford 250. Maybe just, yep. again, it, how would you, to, to beat those guys with your own race car, um, how, how does that feel? Like, do you remember, like, you know, in the hour or so after that race, did you, did anything kind of run through your mind, like, hey, I'm back, or maybe I'm being too, too dramatic for yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, a little bit, but, I mean, I'm not, I don't think really like that. I just uh, I just feel like that we are racing against some of the best in the country. I mean, we're racing against Kurt did win the Oxford 250. Wayne Hallowell is there racing against this right. week when he won a 250. Yeah. Mike Rowe races against this week when he's a 250 guy, you know, a couple yeah. of them. Yeah. Um, and then, then there's, you know, the regulars like Billy Rogers, who's always been a top dog at Beach Ridge. Yeah, always. Um, Barrington's done well and won a championship there. You know, that we're racing against, I, I mean, I think we're racing against more competition on Saturday night than we was to go in, if, if I was to go into a pass race at Beach Ridge. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. You know, cause there's 16 cars, I think, on Saturday night there, and 10 or 11 of them are that good. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of places will say things like, "Oh, you got ten cars that can win on every any given night," and I think most of us realize that's that's just not true. I think at Beechridge that probably is true, because I think the other thing is those some of those it teams is. you mentioned they getting around Beechridge consistently well is not easy, and I think when you've like those guys you all mentioned, uh, they figured out how to do it over the years, and, and that that's a really tough. It is to the crack. hardest place to get a car set up and go good at, mm. and go good at for a long-distance race or even a short race. Yeah. It's just it's super hard. Why Does it change? Does it change from week to week? It does if you're in a small window where your car, you know, goes good, but you do one tweak to it, it goes really bad the other way, or a tweak and it goes really, really the other way, mm. you know, you kind of need to be more forgiven and we found a sweet spot with my car, I think, and that's why I'm excited to get back there and race. Awesome. And we got the sweep off, so <laughs> there's no way to the sweep, but uh, we have to do this kind of deal after that. Awesome. Well, good. Listen, I, uh, on that note, I think I'll, we'll wrap this up and I want to say thanks again, uh, thanks again for joining us and, um, we will, uh, we'll see you before, uh, too long passes, I'm sure. All right, buddy. Looking forward to it.
Thanks again to Trevor. Thanks to Nick Reno before that for coming on the show. Uh, this has been another episode of Loose Wheels. It is the auto racing podcast of centralmain.com. Centralmain.com slash sports. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Find me on Twitter at T Barrett GWC. Happy to have you along for the ride. Uh, whatever race you're going to this weekend, enjoy it. Uh, get out. Again, it looks like we're going to have some more great weather, and uh, we need to take advantage because it won't be long from now. We'll be shoveling snow. We'll be complaining about how it's too cold. So get out and enjoy short track racing. Get out and enjoy motorsports. And we will talk to you next week on Loose Wheels.